Hello, welcome to our new lecture series. This is a crop anatomy lecture eight. And in this lecture series, we'll be looking at the tissue. Remember the previous lecture, we looked at the types of tissues. So let's move on. What is a tissue? A group or masses of cells that are alike in origin, structure and function form a tissue. So a tissue is formed by a group of or masses of cells which have similar origin which have similar structure and similar function. So the plant body itself is characterized into two main parts. We have the vegetative tissues and we have the reproductive tissues. So whatever it is that you're talking about with respect to tissues, we have tissues that are designated with the formation of vegetative parts. And we have tissues that are designated with the formation of reproductive parts. This lecture, we categorize tissue into three principal groups. We have the meristems or meristematic tissue, we have the permanent tissue, <coughs> we have the secretory tissue. The meristem or meristematic tissue consists of a group of cells which remain in continuous state of division. The characteristic features of meristematic tissue are as follows. They are composed of immature cells which are in state of division and growth, which means the plant continually, these, these, these cells are in constant division. Those cells that never grow old. They are in constant division. They are immature cells. They never grow old. They continue to remain immature because they continually stay in division. We call the gap to continually divide. So the intercellular spaces are not found between them because they continue to divide to fill up the spaces. They may be rounded, oval, or polygonal in shape. They are always living and thin walled. Each cell of meristematic tissue possesses abundant cytoplasm and one or more nuclei in it. Vacuoles may be quite small or altogether absent. The meristem and growth of plant body. Beginning with the division of the oospore, spore, the vascular plant generally produces new cells and forms new organs until it dies. From the point of imbibition of water by the seed, and which leads to the, form, the, 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 the emergence of the plumule and the uh, apocotyl, the, the cells begin to divide. Okay? They begin to divide and continually divide, forming tissues, forming organs, until the plant dies off, until the plant becomes mature and dies off. So a mature plant is a plant that has, is composed of the adult and juvenile tissues. That means tissues that are in constantly immature states and the adult tissues that are in mature states. So we're talking about the apical meristem that are, div that are constantly juvenile tissues and we are talking about the adult tissues which are divided from the apical tissues or the meristematic tissues. The term meristose means convenient divisibility or divisible, which emphasizes the cell division activity characteristics. Okay? The meristem usually occur at the apices of all main and lateral shoots and roots, and thus their number in a single plant becomes quite large. In addition, plants bearing secondary increase in thickness possesses extensive meristem. The vascular and cock cambium responsible are responsible for the secondary growth. The combined activities of all these meristems give rise to a complex and large plant body. Yes, the combined activities of the meristematic plant is what gives rise to the plant body you're seeing. A big plant like uh, Iroko tree, the maize plant, the grass plant, all the kinds of plants you're seeing. What make them to look the way they are doing or become grown or little the size they are is because of the combined activities of all these meristems. Classification of meristems. We have meristems based on stage of development. We have these are pro-meristems or primordial meristems. This is a region of new growth in a plant body where the foundation of new organs or parts of organs is initiated. The cells of this region are isodermetric, thin-walled, vacuolated with active cytoplasm and early stages of pits. As soon as the cells in this region begin to change in size, shape and character of wall and cytoplasm, setting off the beginning of differentiation, they are no longer a part of typical meristem. They have passed beyond the earliest stage. Based on origin of initiating cells, primary and secondary, so origin. Uh, the primary meristems are those that build up the primary part of the plant, okay, and consist in part of pro-meristems. In primary meristems, pro meristem is always the earliest stage. The main primary stems are, the, are at the apices of roots, leaves, stems, and similar appendages. 
The secondary meristems appears later at the stage of development of an organ of a plant body. Secondary meristems always lie along the side of the stem and root. The primary tissue acquire the power of some primary tissues acquire the power of division and become meristematic. These tissue build up the secondary meristems, arising as new meristems in tissue which is not meristematic. Example of such uh, primary tissues that become secondary meristematic are phylogen or cambium formed from mature cells such as the epidema and phloem cells. The primary meristems build up the healthy, structural, and functional complete part plant body. The secondary meristems later add to that body, forming supplementary tissues that functionally replace the healthy form tissues or serve in protection and repair of wounded region. The primary meristems is known to form the early structural and functional complete plant body. Okay? The secondary meristems, what it does is just to add to what the primary meristems have done. You just had supplementary tissues functionally replace early torn uh, injured part or severe area or wounded regions. Now, meristem based on position in plant body, we have three types of that. We have the apical meristems, which lies at the apex of the stem and root of vascular plants. Due to the activities of this meristem, the organ increase in length, so they are responsible for increasing the plant in length. These cells always maintain their individuality; they continue to perpetuate themselves and position and are called apical cells or apical initials. Intercalary meristems, these intercalary meristems merely, are merely portions of apical meristems that have become separated from the apex during development by layers of more mature or permanent tissues and left behind as the apical meristem moves on in growth. Lateral meristem, the lateral meristems are composed of such initials which divide mainly in one plane, periclinally, and increase the diameter of an organ. These tissues are responsible for growth in thickness of plant body, e.g. cambium and cork cambium. Epical meristem, and the, you can see it here. We have the root, we have the shoot, or the stem, epical meristem. I said here that we have the protodem, the grand meristem and the procambium are the three characters of the apical meristems. These three are found at this area. They, are, they, they emerge from the, the uspo, the, the embryo of the seed or the seed. Okay? From there, the protodem forms the epidermis. We've talked about the epidermis. We'll talk more about it later on when we get to tissue systems. Okay? So we talk about the grand meristem, which forms the pith and the cortex. The cortex leads to the formation of the coccambium which leads to the formation of cock and phallodem. The procambium, which is the, forms the primaries and primary xylem and phloem, also leads to the formation of the vascular cambium, which forms the secondary vascular tissues. Excuse me. The root as well, the root apical meristem also have similar uh, primary tissues, primary meristems, which also form the apex, the cortex only here, yeah? The vascular cylinder leading to the formation of the pericycle, the primary phloem and xylem, cock cambium like that of the stem, and cock vascular cambium also same here. Now we have the three types based on position: the lateral, the apical, the intercalary, and the lateral. These are the lateral meristems. These are the intercalary meristems. They were left behind by the apex so these ones here will lead to the formation of leaves and uh, branches based on function primary meristem at the apex of stem and root is distinguished into three tissues the protoderm the protoderm is the outermost tissue which develops into epidermis the procambium it develops into primary vascular tissues Ground or fundamental meristem, this develops into ground tissue and pit. The cells in this region become differentiated in later stages to hypodermis, cortex, endodermis, pericycle, pit rays, and pit. All right, so we have this, uh, the, a, a clearer view of what we were talking about earlier on. You can see them, okay? Endeavor to study them. This is the protoderm. This entirely is a young leaf. The protoderm from here forms the epidermis on the leaf. The shoot apical meristem is the 
this region here where it continues to grow upward we have the mother cells here which continue to divide to form the ground meristem and the procambium procambium leads to the formation of the vascular cambium okay and the, uh, the vascular tissues we have the node the axillary board and pro primodium this primodium leads to the formation of the, the is the, is like the foundation of the formation of new shoots okay the base of subtending leaf and the pith the pith we have the same thing here we have the root cap the root apical meristem here which leads to the formation of the procambium the ground meristem and the protoderm which forms the epidermis and the root hairs permanent tissues these are tissues which grow which growth has stopped either completely or for some time being sometimes they again become meristematic partially or wholly the cells of these tissues may be living or dead in such cases they are thin walled when they are living and thick walled when they are living or dead the permanent tissues may be simple or complex. A simple tissue is made up of one type of cells forming a uniform homogeneous system of cells. We talked about the types of uh, tissues earlier on. So the parenchyma tissue is made up of the parenchyma cells, etc., uh, cholenchyma and so on. So a complex tissue is made up of more than one type of cells working together as a unit. So the complex tissue consists of parenchyma tissue, parenchymatous and sclerenchymatous cells. So when these two types of cells come together to form a tissue, they become a complex tissue. So we have an example, the xylem and the phloem. So let's look at a simple tissue which are made up of one type of cell, parenchyma tissue. The parenchyma tissue is composed of living cells which are variable in their morphology and physiology. They understand. They are made up of living cells which are variable. The parenchyma of one area is different from the parenchyma of another area. So they have different morphology and different physiology. But generally, having thin walls and polyhedral shape, they are of the same type of shape despite their difference in morphology and function. And are concerned with vegetative activities of the plant. That's all. They, they consist of isodiametric, thin walled, and equally expanded cells. The cells are oval, rounded, or polygonal in shape, having well developed spaces among them. It makes up large parts of various organs in many plants, pith, mesophyll of leaves, the pulp of fruits, the endosperm of seeds, cortex of seeds and roots, and other organs of plants consist mainly of parenchyma. The parenchyma cells also occur in the xylem and the phloem. Parenchyma cells help to give rigidity to the plant body when touched. It acts as a special storage tissue to store food material in the form of starch grains, proteins, fats, and oils. The parenchyma cells that contain chloroplasts in them make chlorenchyma, which are responsible for photosynthesis in green plants. Okay, we have that chlorenchyma. In water plants, the erenchyma keep up the buoyancy of the plant. So, for those plants that tend to photosynthesize, they have something called chlorenchyma. While in water plants, in any for the plants to float on water and grow, it means that it has an erenchyma tissue. Vegetative propagation by cutting takes place because of meristematic potentials of the parenchyma cells, which divide and develop into buds and adventitious roots. All right. So for the, a, a plant that has an, a parenchyma cells in a large portion, once the stem is cut and planted in a nursery or on a bed in the field, and uh, directly, for instance, cassava is a plant that is being propagated by stem cutting. and it means that stem contains a lot of parenchyma. That's why we are able to cultivate it via stem cutting. And so that is the reason why you see those stem cuttings grow, is because of the presence of parenchyma. Parenchyma originates from procambium and vascular cambium. The procambium produces parenchyma with the primary vascular tissues, while the vascular cambium produces parenchyma that are associated with the secondary vascular tissues. It may also develop from the phylogene in the form of phylodem. Let's look at cholenchyma now. Cholenchyma, this is a living tissue which is composed of somewhat elongated cells with thick primary non lignified that means a lack lignin, walls. It is important because it is also early developed. It is early development and adaptability to changes in a rapid growing organ, especially those of increase in length. When the cholenchyma becomes functional, no other strongly supporting tissues have appeared. It gives support to so the growing organs which do not develop much woody tissues. Cholenchyma may occur in the root cortex, particularly if it were exposed to light. It is not found in leaves, stem of monocotyledons. 
The chief primary function of the tissue is to give support to the plant body. They carry out photosynthesis when the chloroplast is present. Now this is the parenchyma tissue itself, which contains a nucleus, a cytoplasm, a vacuum, intercellular spaces. This is a storage parenchyma in which there is no vacuum because it's filled with starch grains. We have the, the palisade parenchyma, those ones associated with the leaves that tend to have chloroplasts in them. Uh, we have the intercellular, the parenchyma for those in water, water plants. So we have the colenchyma tissue, the thickened corners, the protoplasm, the cell wall, and the vacuum. Sclerochyba, this tissue consists of thick walled cells, often lignified, whose main function is mechanical. This is a supporting tissue that withstands various strains, which results from stretching and bending of plant organs without any damage to the thin walled, softer cells. Okay, so sclerenchyma is the reason why certain plants have to bend when wind comes in this direction and be able to return back to it. The sclerenchyma uh, cells are, or tissues are the reason why certain plants have to withstand some mechanical stress that is being applied upon them by virtue of wind impact. Okay, if not of the sclerenchyma tissue, those plants will break by any minor stretch. Sclerenchyma cells collectively make up sclerenchyma tissues. The cells do not possess living protoplasts at maturity. The cells are grouped into fiber and sclerates. The fibers are elongated sclerenchyma cells, usually with pointed ends. The walls of fibers are usually lignified, that means they, both con they contain lignin. Their walls are sometimes thickened that the lumen or cell cavity is greatly reduced or obliterated. The fibers are dead and purely mechanical in function, as stated earlier. The average length is 1 to 3 millimeters in angiosperms. The fibers are divided into two groups, xylem fiber and extraxillary fibers. Sclerites. These are widely distributed in the plant body. They are usually not much longer than they are broad, usually occurring. They are usually not much longer than they are broad, usually occurring in single or groups, commonly found in the cortex and pit of gymnosperms and dicots. Occurring leaves of many species in few to abundant amounts, also common in fruits and seeds. Presence of pits on cell wall, they are grouped into, they are grouped into four categories, brachiosclerites, macrosclerites, osteosclerites, and astrosclerites. Yeah, these are them. Okay. So we have a simple, you no know, lumen. No, you see the lumen? The thick cell wall, no protoplasm. This thick cell is due to the lignin, no protoplasm as well. We have the lumen, which is almost obliterated for the sclerites. We have the pit, and we have a thickened cell wall. So you can see them, they are very numerous, widely distributed across the plant tissue. Now, complex tissue. For complex tissue, we have just the vascular tissues. And under that, we're talking about the xylem, which is a conducting tissue which conducts water and mineral nutrients from the root to the leaves. It is also meant for mechanical support. It's composed of different kinds of elements, tracheids, fibers, and fiber tracheids, vessels or trache, wood fiber, wood parenchyma. The tracheid is a fundamental cell type in xylem. It is an elongated tube-like cell having tapering, rounded or oval ends, and hard and lignified walls. It is without protoplast and non-living at maturity. The tracheids are specifically adapted to function of conduction. The rigid and thick walls also aid in support. In the phylogenetic development of fiber, the thickness of the, of the wall increases while the diameter of the lumen decreases. The length decreases and number and size of pits found on the walls decreases too. The lumen becomes narrow or obliterated. At this point, it is believed that there is either little or no conduction of water through such cells. Typical fiber is formed. Between such cells, that is fiber and tracheids, are many transitional forms which are neither both. They are called fiber tracheids. Versus in the phylogenetic development of the tracheid, the diameter of the cell has increased and the wall has become perforated by large openings. Due to this adaptation, water can move from cell to cell without resistance. The openings in vessels are called perforation. Area of perforation is called perforation plate. 
Vessels are formed from procambium cells or derivative of cambium by the fusion of cells end to end during the last stages of development. So this is a xylem tissue. We have, okay, as you can see, these are trachis. These openings here are trachis. These are pits. These are trachids, this point here, this row is a track, like trachids. This point here is a trachids, okay? So we have, uh, at the back of the trachids, we have the ground tissue cells, and the vessel elements are these points here. These points here, you can see there's a perforation here, there's a separation which allows water to move through, okay? These are the vessel elements. Pitted ends joined together form vessel elements. The vessel elements uh, allow for the flow of water through it. Okay? So we have perforations here. Perforations here. These are called perforation plates. Okay? This whole thing is now joined together to become the vessel elements. The track is these are the trachids. Okay. These vessel elements join together form the trachids, but one of these is a vessel element. All right. Wood parenchyma. These are the parenchyma cells which frequently occur in the xylem of most plants. In secondary xylem, such cells occur vertically or less elongated and place end to end. Wood or xylem parenchyma, this is what it's called. These cells assist directly or indirectly in the conduction of water upward through the vessels and trachids. The fundamental cell type of phlegm is a sieve element. Phlegm like xylem is a complex tissue and consists of the following elements. Sieve elements, companion cells, phlegm fiber, and phlegm parenchyma. In the pteridophyte and gymnosperms, only sieve cells and phlegm parenchyma are present. Sieve elements. The conducting elements of the phlegm are collectively known as sieve elements, just as we have physical elements. The sieve areas are depressed wall, areas with cluster of perforations through which the protoplasts of the adjacent sieve elements are interconnected by connecting strands. They generally possess primary wall chiefly cellulose. Its protoplast lacks a nucleus when fully developed and functional. Presence of slime is an important property of sieve elements. Companion cells. D cell is a specialized type of parenchyma cell which is closely associated in origin position and function with sieve tube elements. It is seen beside the sieve element. These cells are living, having abundant granular cytoplasm and prominent elongated nucleus, which is retained throughout the life of the cell. The nuclei of the companion cells serve as the nucleus of sieve tubes. Companion cells are formed by longitudinal division of mother cell of the sieve tube element before specialization of the cells begin. Daughter cell becomes companion cell, while other becomes sieve tube elements. They occur only in angiosperms accompanying most sieve elements. Flame fiber. Many flowering plants possess fiber as a prominent part of both, its primary and secondary. The walls of the fiber may be lignified or not lignified. It is used for the manufacture of cords, ropes, mats and clothes because of its strength and bast or bast fiber. The phloem contains parenchyma cells that are concerned with many activities such as storage of starch, fat and oil. Tannins and resins are also found in these cells. There, there are two systems of this cell found in the phloem. Phloem parenchyma and phloem x-ray. The phloem parenchyma is not found in most Monocotyledons. C. 
sieve tube plates, sieve tube element, companion cell by the side. Okay. So these are made of flame pad and camera cells. So we have the sieve tube element, we have the companion cell, which serve like a shock absorber, we have the plasma dust matter, we have the sieve plates, the point of attachment, and we have the flame parenchyma binding them together. Secreted tissues. These are tissues concerned with the secretion of gums, resins, volatile oils, nectar, latex, and other substances. Laticiferous and glandular tissues are examples of such secreted tissues. Latex is usually present in the family of many flowering plants. This substance may be white, yellow, or pinkish in color. This is a viscous liquid fluid and established to be colloidal in nature. The laticiferous ducts in which latex is found are of two types. Non-articulated latex ducts or latex cells. These ducts are independent units which extend as branch structures for long distances in the plant body. They originate as minute structures, elongated and quickly ramify in all directions of the plant body by repeated branching, but do not fuse together. The walls of the duct are soft and very often thick found in Calactropis, Ephobeca, Vinca, etc. Commonly occur in leaves traveling through the vascular bundle ramify in the mesophyll. Articulate latex ducts of latex vessels. These ducts are ves or vessels are the results of anastomizing of many cells together. Anastomizing means the fusing of many cells together. They originate in the merisem. It is a combination of cells joined together to form a tube in the mold of xylem. It is living and coenocyte. Coenocytic, which is composite, papaveracea, euphobiacea, exmoracea, etc. So we have them in such uh, families. Glandular tissues. These tissues consist of special structures. The glands, these glands contain some secretory products. It may consist of isolated cells or small group of cells with or without central cavity. There are various types, digestive glands, digestive enzymes, and nectaries, nectar. There may be internal oil glands, mucilage secreting glands, secreting gums, racing and tanning, etc. Digestive glands, secreting enzymes, outer secretory glands, also known as hydatodes, or external glandular epidermal airs, nectaries, etc. Oil glands. These are internal glands which frequently contain essential oils in them. These oils are available and odoriferous. They originate due to split of certain cells, but more in abundance by the breaking down of cells with volatile oil. Such oil glands are found commonly in citrus, eucalyptus, and other plants. Gland restricts secreting resins, gums, etc. These substances are secreted and conducted in ducts. These ducts form extensive systems extending both vertically and horizontally. Despite digestive glands, in certain insectivorous plants, there are special glands which secrete protein digesting enzymes, e.g. Drose, drosera. Uh, they secrete certain uh, uh, enzymes which tend to digest the protein in insects. Sorry for that break. Hydatodes. Many plants possess special structures which exudate water under conditions of low transpiration and abundant soil moisture. They occur at the tip of the leaves of pistia and other areas, water isent, grasses, garden and garden matrochin, etc. Nectaries. Many insect pollinated native plants produce nectar to attract insects. This substance is secreted by special cellular structures called nectaries. So this is an example of a secretory tissue. We have the tracheids, secretory cells, the globules of resins, resin ducts, you have, and so on. So this comes, brings us to the end of this lecture series. We will continue on tissue systems in next lecture series. Thank you. Ensure you subscribe, like this um, video, and drop your comment in the comment section. Thank you. See you in next class.